I'm going to get started. Um, what did I do with that thing? <clears throat> My name is Robert Hesch. I'm the uh, stroke director here at IMC. Um, also the medical director of the Neurosciences Clinical Program, so representing neurosciences up and down the Intermountain System. Um, today I'm going to be talking about emergent ass assessment and management in acute ischemic stroke. <clears throat> uh, we've put together, uh, from, a, from a neuro standpoint, we've put together a, uh, a curriculum uh, for the first responders lecture series. Um, so this one is obviously acute ischemic stroke. Uh, in the future, we'll have a uh, presentation on hemorrhage uh, and on seizures and status epilepticus. And I'd like to open up to the group uh, requests from a neurological standpoint, what would be uh, good lectures for, for your uh, services to hear. Um, we could do neurotrauma also, but I know that there's also the, the trauma series going on kind of staggering with ours. So um, maybe at some point a, a, comp a combined neurotrauma lecture would be a good one also. Anyway, any requests, just let us know. Uh, today I'll talk, uh, I'll hit on a couple of clinical vignettes. We'll talk about the fundamentals of acute ischemic stroke, treatment in acute ischemic stroke, and then emergent assessment and management. What do, what do you do in the field? So just a couple of clinical vignettes to keep in the back of our mind while we talk about this. Uh, first is a 55-year-old woman history of diabetes, presents with two hours of acute onset right face arm leg weakness, okay? Completely plegic on that side, flaccid weakness, uh, but normal language, okay? Second is a 75-year-old man with a history of atrial fibrillation, presents with three and a half hours of language problems and right face and arm weakness, leg is intact. So what are you gonna do for these people? What are we thinking about? Um, in our initial approach. So I thought it would be useful to just start with a couple of definitions of stroke. Um, so strictly speaking, the word stroke comes from the fact that it's an abrupt onset uh, neurological deficit. Okay. Um, in an acute ischemic stroke, which is the focus of this lecture, you have an abrupt onset of uh, interruption of blood flow that leads to neurological dysfunction. In hemorrhagic stroke, um, you have, again, an abrupt onset of neurological dysfunction um, resulting from bleeding into the brain. So that can either be, for the purposes of the American Heart Association, it can be bleeding into the brain itself, into the brain tissue, or bleeding uh, into the subarachnoid space, which is, which is one of the coverings of the brain. So the acute hemorrhagic stroke or hemorrhagic stroke or intracerebral hemorrhage is a separate discussion. So today when you hear me use the word stroke, I'm referring to ischemic stroke, which is a blockage of blood flow. Okay. When, I, when I refer to hemorrhage, I call it ICH or intracerebral hemorrhage or in, this, in the case of subarachnoid hemorrhage, I, I consider those kind of diff completely different animals. The other term that I wanted to clear up is TIA. Um, so TIA strands, stands for transient ischemic attack, and a transient ischemic attack means temporary interruption of blood flow. Um, presents just like a stroke, except by definition, patients go back to normal within 24 hours. And the old definition was you have an abrupt onset of neurological deficit, and then you go back to normal within 24 hours. Really the new definition is that happens and your MRI is normal. If you, have a, if you end up with a spot on your MRI, and we end up calling it a stroke that you recovered from, even if you go back to normal within 24 hours. Um, we considered a mild, mild stroke. Our approach is the same. Our clinical approach is the same. Um, we try to avoid terms like, uh, like mini stroke and things like that. Um, we, we usually just call it a mild stroke or a warning sign for a stroke or a TIA for the purposes of education, education of patients. Um, patients generally know that TIA stands for a, for a mild stroke. Um, but we're trying to get rid of terms like mini stroke and then CVA for stroke. We just call it stroke. It's fewer syllables anyway. <clears throat> so uh, the clinical presentation of stroke, 
um, <clears throat> the stroke symptoms are generally sudden onset of weakness or numbness on one side of the body, sometimes can be on both sides, but generally, the general presentation is weakness or numbness on one side, uh, trouble speaking or understanding speech, so problems getting the words out, uh, problems understanding or following commands, or slurred speech, okay? Loss of balance or coordination, sometimes called ataxia, problems walking, teetering off to one side. Um, vision changes, so any kind of vision change. Cuts in your visual field, double vision, loss of vision in one eye are all signs of stroke. Um, and then we say, we say severe headache. Usually with an ischemic stroke, this is uh, less prominent. Usually the severe headache goes along with the hemorrhages. There are exceptions, especially when it's in the posterior circulation or if there's a, if there's a tear in one of the blood vessels, so if you have like a dissection. So you often end up with uh, pain in the neck uh, as opposed to really pain in the head. If, the, if, the, if, if a headache is a really prominent uh, symptom, it's ge you know, generally but not always in the hemorrhage category. So remember the signs of stroke. So this is our, our inner mountain uh, mnemonic for knowing the signs of stroke. So we use the term be fast. Um, B stands for balance. So any sudden loss of balance or coordination could be a sign of a stroke. Eyes, so any change in vision, like I said, double vision, loss of vision in one eye, cuts in the visual field. Uh, facial weakness. Uh, arm weakness or, or weakness of the leg, uh, speech problems, that, that includes slurred speech, problems getting the words out, problems understanding speech. And then importantly, as this will be the, the theme of this discussion, uh, get to a place where you can get definitive care as soon as possible. Time is of the essence. Uh, and noting the time that symptoms started is really important. So fr from, an, from an EMS and first responders standpoint, we, we often rely on the information that's gathered by the teams to, to help guide our um, understanding of when the symptoms started. We call that the last seen normal or the last known well. And we, use, we use that, not, not the time that they were discovered, okay, but the last time that they were seen normal that we can document. <clears throat> and the reason for that is that during a stroke, with every second that ticks by, 32,000 brain cells die. So uh, the earlier we can get treatment and we can restore blood flow, the more brain we save and the more disability we avoid. So like I said, the, um, we're going to be talking about acute ischemic stroke. Um, acute ischemic stroke results from a, abrupt dis an abrupt disruption in arterial blood flow to the brain. Um, within seconds of interruption of blood flow, neurological uh, dysfunction ensues. Um, usually the presentation in, uh, in stroke is abrupt. Um, there are some cases where it's you know, more gradual on, in onset over minutes or kind of a starting and stopping course, like a stuttering course. But generally, if you, you know, the as the term stroke implies, uh, comes on rapidly. Blood flow disruption leads to brain ischemia. Brain ischemia means the brain is de deprived of blood flow. Um, initially, the brain is stunned, and this, if blood flow is restored, then brain function um, can be restored and brain can be saved, and we avoid parts of the brain dying. Um, as time goes on, the brain doesn't get enough oxygen and glucose. Uh, the brain, um, brain cells start to die. When um, the process that leads to the brain cell death is that the electrolyte gradients are disrupted. So sodium and potassium gradients are disrupted. Calcium enters the cell. Calcium is poisonous to cells, causing cell death and the electrolyte gradient disruption leads to brain swelling, okay? Um, so the cells fill with water. And this is, a, this is a principle that kind of underlies all of our imaging. The, this, 
the cells filling with water. And it also underlies, besides you know, having neurological dysfunction and all of the disability that goes along with that, uh, the brain swelling is what can lead to some of the feared complications in stroke, like herniation. Okay. So two broad types of stroke. Um, one is we call a thrombotic stroke, or stroke due to thrombosis. Um, this is due to a local blood clot in the blood vessel. <clears throat> the most common cause of this, uh, of thrombosis, <clears throat> is intracranial atherosclerosis. So the hardening of the arteries, that just like you get in the heart um, and in the neck, can also occur in the blood vessels in the head. And eventually, a piece of that atherosclerosis atherosclerotic plaque breaks off, <clears throat> and that, ex that exposes a part of the blood vessels that promotes clot formation. So you get a thrombotic stroke from that. The second type <clears throat> is, um, a, uh, is an embolic stroke. So that's when a clot forms somewhere else in the body and then goes up into the brain. Okay, so it can form in the heart, can form in the blood vessels in the neck. Uh, and a piece of that breaks off and goes up into the brain. In people who have cardiac arrest, the kind of the same, and with hypoperfusion, the same processes are at place, are, are, are at play, where the brain is de deprived of oxygen and glucose and cells start to die, uh, just happens to affect the entire brain rather than one single vessel territory. So when, the, when a patient comes into the emergency department and they have stroke-like symptoms, our, our first order of business is getting a CT. Um, so basically identifying that they've had a stroke and getting them to CT as soon as possible to find out if it's an ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke. Okay. If it's an ischemic stroke and it really has happened very recently, we expect the CT to still be normal because it takes time for the cells to die and fill with water, and it's really the cells filling with water that shows up on the CT, okay? So on CT, if you look at a CT, uh, there's two kind of broad principles. One is that bright stuff on the CT uh, corresponds to bone, so this is, the, this is the skull here, or blood, okay? And dark stuff, uh, corresponds to things of water density, okay? So in the middle here, you have the spinal fluid in the, in the ventricles and these fluid-filled sacs, and uh, that's of water density, okay? Strokes, when they've evolved, when the, when the brain cells have died and, the, and they fill with water, uh, those appear dark on CT, okay? Uh, so this person, had the CT at about 24 hours after stroke onset. Uh, and you can see here that there's this area uh, of what we call hypodensity. So it's water density, uh, more on the water density of, of the brain. So this is, this is how a stroke looks at about 24 hours. It usually takes at least three hours for this to start showing up. So when they, if you come in, if the patient comes into the emergency department three hours after stroke, three hours or less after stroke onset, we expect this, we expect it to be normal. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> hemorrhages, on the other hand, will show up on the CT immediately, like within minutes. So you see bright things on, on the CT you, immediately after hemorrhage, and, uh, and the CT is very sensitive for for hemorrhage. <coughs> Excuse me. The, the other thing that, that we get in the emergency department often, although we're trying to phase it out just a bit, um, is a CT angiogram, so a CTA. And the CTA is useful. Uh, so a CTA, uh, the patient gets dye injected through a vein, um, and then they take the CT right at the time that the dye is going through the, the blood vessels that go up into the brain. Uh, C the CTA is really good for looking for large vessel occlusions and uh, helping identify patients who might be a candidate for um, interventional therapy. 
so where the, the radiologist goes in through a blood vessel in the leg and, and retrieves the clot. <clears throat> so this is a picture of a CTA. So uh, left, right, here's the eyeballs. Um, and these are the blood vessels here, the large blood vessels that are filling with dye. And uh, this is the same person that had this stroke here. Um, and you can see on this side that dye fills the blood vessel pretty well. On this side, it stops right here. That's where there's a piece of clot sitting in that blood vessel causing that stroke that we see right here. Okay. And you can kind of make out here, so this is higher up in the brain, and dye is going into all these smaller blood vessels. Um, and you can make out right here that there's not as much dye in the blood vessels as there is on this side. That, that corresponds to that same area of stroke. So it's helpful in that sense. This would be a patient who would be a candidate for interventional therapy. So our mantra in stroke care, um, because we want to avoid this area of stroke, our mantra is that time is brain. And the, the, it's, this is well supported in the literature that uh, you can uh, reduce neurological deficit if you get patients treatment earlier, okay? Um, and the kind of the, the medical science thinking behind this is that when you have a stroke, there's an area that is, that's dead. There's an area of the brain that's dead. It's been deprived of blood flow long enough that even if you restore blood flow to it, you can't get it back. We call that the ischemic core. Around that area uh, is uh, uh, brain tissue that's at risk. So that's the brain tissue that's stunned because of low blood flow. Um, and the thinking is that if you restore blood flow to that area around the core zone, which we call the penumbra, you can, uh, you can save that tissue and reduce neurological deficit, reduce disability. <clears throat> and the way that we do this is uh, by giving thrombolytic therapy. Thrombolytic therapy, also known as TPA, um, or by doing an intervention. Um, interventional therapy, which can be TPA that's delivered right into the clot by the radiologist, or the radiologists have uh, a wire that goes up that has like a Swiss Army knife on the end, <laughs> and they can pull out clots through several different mechanisms, either vacuum it out or retrieve it with a stent kind of uh, device. Um, but each of these therapies has a time window um, around which um, it's effective and safe, okay? So the, the standard time window that we, that we think of and that, that we like for everyone to, to keep in mind uh, when responding to patients in the field is the three-hour IV TPA window. So within three hours of last seen normal, if patients have neurological deficits and they have no contraindications, such as a hemorrhage in the brain, they're a candidate for IV TPA. Okay. Um, we extend that time window. We know that that time window is a little bit, is safe out to four and a half hours in certain subgroups of patients. So patients with no history of stroke or diabetes, no history of anticoagulant use, not with a very large stroke and, and age less than 80. Um, if all of these factors are met, in addition to all of the other, uh, not having any other contraindications, uh, then IVTPA can be given out to four and a half hours. After four and a half hours, the risk of giving TPA outweighs the benefits. Or actually, they're, they're kind of like even at that point. Um, however, out to six hours, intra-arterial TPA can be given. So that's the one where the radiologists go up through an artery in the leg and go up right next to the clot and they can spray TPA onto the clot and hopefully break it up. Uh, this is usually done um, if a large vessel occlusion has been identified on the CTA. So that there were some studies in the past where they kind of did this on all comers, even if they didn't have a large vessel occlusion, it was found not to be effective. 
recent studies have shown that if there's a large vessel occlusion that's identified, like we, I showed you on the previous slide, um, there's, there's good evidence that uh, either doing intra-arterial TPA or using the device to pull the clot out uh, can reduce disability. And that'll usually be done if the patient presents within three hours uh, and has a large vessel occlusion, they'll get IV TPA and then go to intra-arterial TPA. Uh, the limit for the intra-arterial TPA is six hours. So after, after six hours and out to eight hours, um, only the, the mechanical disruption kind of devices will be used. So they don't spray anything else into the clot. They'll just use the, you know, the retrievers or the vacuum type machine. In the back part of the brain, there's the basilar artery. Uh, we extend our window out uh, even farther in the basilar artery because if the basilar artery isn't opened up, then it's game over. <laughs> so, um, also the the risk of bleeding in the in the back part of the brain is is slightly less um, after ischemic stroke. So it's safer to give intraarterial TPA and to do mechanical disruption out there uh, in the back out to 12 hours. <clears throat> so our general approach is. When a patient has stroke symptoms, uh, the team is mobilized as soon as possible to, to deliver TPA. So our, our hypothesis, when we hear a patient has stroke symptoms, is that we're gonna give TPA until proven otherwise. That we're gonna do some type of inter intervention until proven otherwise. So the first thing we ask is, are they a candidate based on time? So it's really important to get that information from EMS, so they're last known well. So if they're outside of the window, the last known well was last night when they went to bed, then they wouldn't be getting TPA. So we've kind of changed our, you know, our super aggressive approach. Uh, if they're within the window, then we wanna know other things um, besides last known well, like what are their other medications that they're on? Um, have they had a stroke recently? Have they had any strokes in the past? Have they ever had a hemorrhage? Is there any history of trauma? Did they have a seizure? Things like that. Uh, and also the blood pressure. So the team is mobilized uh, because our philosophy, again, time is brain, and that not only do we use the three hour TPA time window, but the earlier you give it in that time window, the safer and more effective it is. So the earlier you get reperfusion of the brain, the better the patient does. I'll so show you some uh, data on that in a minute. But the, the thrombolytic that we use uh, as neurologists is tissue plasminogen activator, or TPA. And the, the goal of TPA is to break up blood clots. And I'm gonna show uh, a little video here. Um, now the video is put out by the company that makes TPA, and I'll, I'll just say I'm not a shill for the company. Unfortunately, I don't get any money from them. <laughs> if you have ways I can get some, I will take it. Um, but I thought this is a good video because it really shows how the, how the medication works. Activase, also known as recombinant tissue plasminogen activator, or TPA, is the only drug approved by the FDA for treatment of stroke. Growing plaque can rupture, promoting thrombus formation, by activating the coagulation cascade. That would be a thrombosis. Platelets and red blood cells aggregate at the site of injury, causing further narrowing of the artery. This impedes blood flow even more and causes turbulence in the artery. It also increases the likelihood of thrombus formation. As the thrombus grows, it causes increased vessel narrowing, leading to partial or even complete occlusion. The occluded artery leads to ischemia and tissue necrosis. When a piece of thrombus breaks off, it's called an embolus as it travels up the artery. During a stroke, ischemia can progress to infarction. Beyond the infarction lies still viable tissue called the penumbra. Cells within the penumbra are potentially salvageable if blood flow and vital oxygen are restored promptly. The penumbra is the focus of fibrinolytic treatment. Now let's look at the thrombus itself. Inside the thrombus are strands of fibrin, the protein that forms a clot. Enmeshed within the fibrin is plasminogen, the inactive precursor of plasmin. Activase is administered by IV infusion within three hours of acute ischemic stroke symptom onset. Activase binds to the fibrin in a thrombus and converts plasminogen to plasmin. 
Plasmin then breaks the strands of fibrin and dissolves the clot. As the clot dissolves, blood flow is restored and viable tissue may be reperfused. Although the original infarction remains, when surrounding cells in the penumbra are saved or reperfused, function may be restored. Activase, the one TPA for stroke, is the only drug approved by the FDA for this indication. Activase is indicated for the management of acute ischemic stroke. Now he goes through and, like one of those things like you hear on like infomercials, where, like, which is all of the contraindications to stroke, which we go through as neurologists each time. Um, but Activase is TPA. That's the trade name for TPA. Uh, lots of things have been studied for uh, reducing disability and stroke. I mean, they've, they've tried just to, you know, tens of millions of dollars on giving medications that will promote uh, the, the penumbra living longer or retard cell death, um, prevent cells from dying. Um, really the only thing that's worked despite years of research uh, in reducing disability um, is TPA. And uh, was first uh, revealed in 20 years ago, actually now, uh, in 1995, and uh, supported in multiple subsequent trials that about 20% more patients improve within three months if our strict protocol is, is followed. Um, and this is counterbalanced by about a 5.8% risk of intracranial bleeding uh, with TPA. So there is, there is a risk that comes along with it, um, but we have pretty good evidence that the earlier that it's given, the safer it is, and that that risk is, uh, counter, is uh, counterbalanced by a significant improvement in disability at three months. This is our contraindications form that we go through. So uh, we give uh, TPA to ischemic stroke patients within three hours or four and a half hours of, of symptom onset. They must have a measurable deficit. Um, CT doesn't show a hemorrhage. It says age, age greater than 18, but that's, I think that's a little bit fluid. Um, contraindications are if the patient is re improving rapidly, if they had a seizure at the time of their stroke, if they've had a stroke or head trauma within the last three months, recent surgery, uh, history of intracranial hemorrhage, uncontrolled blood pressure at the time, so uh, blood pressure greater than 185 over 110. Um, what we would do if they came in with that is we would treat the blood pressure and try to get it sustained less than those numbers. Um, reason being that if the blood pressure runs really high uh, and you restore blood flow to that area of the brain that's, that has died, the stroked out part of the brain, um, the blood pressure is really high, the, the risk of hemorrhage is also high. Um, if they're on blood thinners, if their platelet count is below 100, um, or if their INR is greater than 1.7, um, then they're not a candidate. We always ask for a serum glucose, so it's good to know if the serum glu glucose was checked in the field, whether they're um, hypo or hyperglycemic. Um, so, with all of these, a lot of these are, are based on history. I mean, some of them we get stat labs on when they come into the emergency department, um, but a lot of them are based on history. So it's, it's, uh, it's very helpful if the first responding team is able to identify some of these, either in talking to family members or just from, from being in the patient's home. So this is our other philosophy, so give more TPA. Uh, the other thing we say is give TPA early and often. Uh, or give TPA sooner and more often. So this is our, the neurology's drum to beat. Um, like I said, we, we know that it's clinically efficacious, and I'll show you some more data in a second, but despite the fact that it has known and documented clinical efficacy, still less than 5% of patients nationwide receive the drug. We do a little bit better here in Utah especially at, at, at IMED, about 20% of our uh, patients receive TPA. Um, I think that's a credit to community education. It's a credit to relationships with EMS. Um, 
and a credit to how fast and efficiently our emergency department and neurology teams move. Um, but where I trained in Baltimore, it's less than 5%. Patients, you know, they kind of spray some Windex on it and hope it gets better over the weekend. And most common reason that they don't get it is because they present outside the time window. I mean, it's really, it, you know, study after study shows that uh, the, re the most common reason for patients not getting TPA is they don't present in time. Um, other reasons are perceived lack of safety. Admittedly, there's some controversy between neurology and um, emergency medicine on exactly how efficacious TPA is or what important outcomes are. Emergency departments will say it doesn't affect mortality, but we as neurologists see as the most important outcome, reduction of disability, and it clearly reduces disability. <clears throat> um, other reasons uh, that TPA is not given is lack of neurologist support, lack of TPA protocols or technology, um, but um, the lion's share of failures are because of missing the time window. <clears throat> so how do we so how do we improve our process to, keep, to give patients more TPA and to stay within the time window? Or not only to give pa more patients TPA, but to give TPA more safely? Two major ways. One is we improve the last seen normal or the last known well to door time. Uh, we can achieve this through many different ways. So outreach uh, to first responders and to, to community teams community education, so Kelly Anderson's our stroke coordinator and Gay Foster is our assistant stroke coordinator and they go out to health fairs and try to educate patients about the warning signs of stroke. And in general, I'll tell you, you know, anecdotally, uh, compared to Baltimore, uh, where I trained, patients here are, are well educated about the warning signs of stroke. Um, and then the third thing is EMS education. So lecture series like this to try to, um, to really drive home the take home message that time is of the essence. Identifying the last known well and then bringing patients in as soon as possible. Uh, and letting the emergency department know that you have a patient that you're bringing in with stroke because then we can mobilize the team earlier. The other thing uh, that's been a, a uh, a focus of um, many uh, national studies and initiatives is to improve the door to needle time. So the door to needle time is the time from which the patient arrives in the emergency, the emergency department to the time that they get TPA. So door to treatment time would be another way of putting it. Um, that's broken down into several uh, time frames. So one is the door to CT time, which is a, thought to be a measure of the ED efficiency. Second is the CT to decision time, which is um, a measurement of neurology efficiency. And then it's the decision to needle time, which is a measure, it was a surrogate measure of pharmacy efficiency. Um, two main things can uh, improve this. So one is uh, an initiative to unite EMS, ED, and stroke team um, around common goals in education. And there was a, an initiative that was started in 2009 called Target Stroke, which was aimed at this. And we'll talk a bunch about that. And the second is to uh, provide neurology coverage in areas where there, where there is none through telemedicine. So basically, you can improve your CT to decision time by bringing a neurologist in um, either through telephone or over a teleservices platform. And we've started doing that, and I'll talk about that some also. So like I said, the take home message of this whole lecture uh, is that um, with time, the benefit of TPA uh, goes down and the harm goes up. So the earlier you can get patients treated, the better. And this graph kind of shows that in uh, living color. So uh, in the 90 minute, in the first 90 minutes, uh, the number of patients benefited compared to harm is about 27 to 1. Okay, in the next 90 minutes, it goes down to about 11 to 1. 
In the next 90 minutes, it goes down to about three to one. And this is, the, this is the four and a half hour cutoff right here. So after four and a half hours, the harm outweighs the benefit. So not only are we shooting for a time window, but we're shooting basically saying as soon as possible. <clears throat> so Target Stroke really took this to heart. Uh, Target Stroke, like I said, was an initiative started in 2009 um, with an 11 point strategy to unite all of the, all of the teams that touch this acute stroke patient when they, um, on the way into the hospital. So EMS pre-notification, so EMS education and then pre-notification of, the, of a, a patient that's gonna be arriving with uh, stroke-like symptoms. Uh, unification of the team around a single call and rapid triage. Uh, they recommended transferring the patient directly to CT, uh, rapid laboratory testing, pre-mixing TPA, um, and then data feedback. And um, so actually b based on these strategies, um, we tried to incorporate as many as we could here at Intermountain Medical Center. And uh, in August of 2014, was it 2014? Uh, I can't remember the date. What was the date that we started the pre-notification, Kelly? What was the date that we started the pre-notification? So in August of 2014, we started to um, implement uh, the pre-notification from EMS. So EMS does the Cincinnati stroke scale. Uh, if the patient has one or more out of three um, stroke, Cincinnati stroke scale symptoms and they call into the emergency department, we activate our stroke team based on that. Okay. And uh, we have, we've seen a really uh, significant impact on our uh, times to uh, CT in the patients uh, that were pre-notified. So the red line shows patients who were not pre-notified. So the door to CT time in these patients is 20 minutes. In patients who were pre-notified, the door to CT time was nine minutes. So that pre-notification shaves off about 11 minutes. Okay. So I'll come back to 11 minutes. Like, who cares about 11 minutes, right? So target stroke uh, data were uh, published in April of 2014, so a little over a year ago. Uh, the goal of target stroke was to use that 11-point strategy uh, to um, achieve a door-to-needle time of 60 minutes. And that's with a door-to-CT time target of about 25 minutes, okay? and to have more than half of the patients have a door-to-needle time less than 60 minutes. Okay. Target stroke included over 70,000 patients at over 1,000 medical centers between 2009 and 2013. And on average, they had, from start to finish, 